IDBM Challenge Season 1 Episode 4 Do you play by the rules or do you create your own rules? Do you follow the system or imagine a new system? In today's episode we spoke with John about what are the flaws of the current, current system and why do we need to find a new way uh, to go forward? Enjoy! Hello, um, welcome to uh, get another episode of Black Tables and Black Chairs. <laughs> I'm here, I'm joined by uh, Mr. John Owens. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for on this me. on this black table with black chairs. <laughs> so, how's your day been so far? Uh, long, but really good. Um, had a big uh, work, a uh, big research download with clients um, all day. Uh, of course, I can't talk about the project on the on the recording, but um, it went really well, um, and we got a lot of good feedback from clients for like what we're doing for next steps, and we help them get over a lot of their fears that they have. Uh, with the project and concerns that they have, um, and really help them understand the design thinking process. Cool. Now, before we go deeper into any, hmm. any, 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 any anything else, um, hmm. could, you, could you like, like kind of share a bit? Like, what's your background? Where do you come sure. from? And what do you do? <clears throat> sure. Um, so my background is mostly in industrial design. Uh, but also really heavily based in design strategy and design research and ethnography. Um, I got into design uh, maybe around the age of 16 or 17 when I was living in Japan during high school. Uh, that was a big inspiration for me because I never knew that products were designed in the way that they they kind of that's now become like a big thing now but you know back in like the 90s and early 2000s like Japan was avant-garde for product design and back then I was a kid I didn't really know what I wanted to do but seeing these things I realized you know I really like these things I want to make stuff like this I didn't even know what product design was called or industrial design was called uh, and it was from then that I started learning about that there's actually a university for art I can go to art school I can be taught these skills I'm taught how to make these things and uh, that was really the gateway um, I went, I did my undergraduate in industrial design um, and then I have a double master's, it's a master's of MSc in um, innovation design and mechanical engineering both from Royal College of Art and uh, Imperial College of Engineering in London uh, and in between that uh, I've worked for a few companies doing product design uh, mostly um, Philips Fuse Project um, a long time ago I had an internship at Olympus when I was very young uh, I'm currently working at IDEO as an industrial designer and product designer. Um, let's see. That was not in chronological order at all. <laughs> but um, mostly what I do as far as industrial design is concerned is creating products that are what are called human-centered, which is a term you know I'm sure you've heard. It's really big. It's coined by IDEO, but basically creating things that improve the quality of human life and are really empathetic towards their user. So going into the field and doing research that's really people-centered to find insights based around what is their actual experience, daily experience, like using this thing or in ha having this service or just being this person in this environment and subjecting yourself to the same conditions that they're subjected to to slowly, as you observe them, become able to empathize through the actual physical experience um, through the, and through their experiences. And from there, really starting to pump out um, all the insights that you gained um, and then what are things that you could do based on those insights um, and then from there des certain designs uh, design solution brainstorming and then taking all of that again and bringing it back into the field and testing it with those users to see like how does this actually have a real tangible impact on their life so there's a lot of repeat in the process but you eventually create something that's really specifically for them um, because there's no point in producing something if it's not going to help someone you know if it's just another thing in the world World. and it feels like we have a lot of that now there's a lot of like stuff for the sake of making stuff um, it's just beautiful and everything does everything like I have a phone that does everything you know it's not really specific towards like one need that I have um, you know I can check my email on it, I can make ca calls on it I can send texts I can 
uh, order food, like it's a one-stop thing. But there's a lot of things in life that really need to be specific, like a pacemaker or surgical equipment. Doesn't need, you know, you don't need to do a million things. It needs to do what it does really well, and it needs to be a very, very good experience for the person that's using it because this thing is going to save lives. It could be the same thing with a medicine treatment kit um, in somewhere in rural Ethiopia or rural Uganda, like. It doesn't need to do everything, but it has to do what it's supposed to do really well and really well for the people it's doing it for. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I mainly uh, focus on. At least for mm. me, it kind of echoes with uh, mm. with the documentary. This yeah. your collective. Can you can you tell a bit? Like, you know, yeah, sure. Are they linked? Like, is it linked to your work? And you know, what is it about? Mm. There's a lot of. I guess there's a lot of subliminal links. Uh, there's a lot of links that I didn't realize was there. And a lot of people at IDEO say that um, we have a thing we call side hustles, which is kind of like a lot of people at IDEO have their own side projects. And they often comment that they didn't realize that the things that they were learning at IDEO kind of bleed into what they do. like how to do empathetic design research, you know, yeah. which also encompasses how do you sit in a room with someone and learn about them and get them to open up to you and trust you, you know, that's very important for conducting an interview for a documentary. It's very, conduct yeah. it's very important for just getting around in a documentary. Um, but the backtrack, so the documentary that I'm making, it's a team of me and two other people, um, and it's a collective called Sentient Collective. Mm. And it's basically an organization that's created to help humanity break away from our current consumption-based narrative that we live in, and to open their minds to something a lot bigger, whether it's circular economy, where it's uh, sharing economy, which is pretty much the same thing, if not quite mm. similar, yeah. or different forms of economy, or different forms of creating tangible economic value, we want to make the point that at the end of the day, mainstream, or may I should say new school economics, so current economic model that we have, it champions profit and capital profit above everything else. And everything else is considered an externality. For example, um, deep underground uh, aquifers of of uh, fossil, uh, sorry, what is, uh, deep underground aquifers of water, uh, topsoil biodiversity, bees, which pollinate all the plants, almost all of the plants that we get most of our fruits and fruits from. Um, these things are considered externalities in our current economic system, which is something that is external. It's not related to the system. Yet the irony in this is that these are the actual things which allow the system to exist in the first place. It allows us to. They allow us to exist in the first place, and we have to have a higher awareness and appreciation of that, along with an appreciation of other things that are not externalities but are treated as so, such as human labor, human rights, you know, not just making something cheap for the sake of making it cheap. We have to think of all of the happiness costs, the social costs that come along with the people who are being forced to, um, and we can say they're not forced, but they are forced mm. to make our clothing at a cheaper price. They, they're not forced in the sense that no one's holding a gun to their head and saying you have to make this clothing cheaper, but they're forced in the way that the economic model forces them into that because that's where their country's GDP is. That's where their country's economic value is and that's the highest they can get for that because we don't have a system that allows people to exist on an equal playing field. What we're trying to do is highlight two things. We're trying to take the environment and very large environmental issues and then the really huge social issues that we have and show that they come from one source which is narrative it's the story we tell each other it's the story we tell ourselves about who we are and how we relate to the planet how we relate to each other so the documentary is an hour and a half um, where we interview several specialists and experts we also interview who we're calling um, extraordinary everyday individuals and these extraordinary extraordinary everyday individuals are people who have basically Basically, um, made huge impact in social or ecological issues simply by changing their way of life, uh, very painlessly and very simply. Um, so one example is a woman named Lauren Singer. She's a 25-year-old uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn living young professional. Uh, in the past four years, she's only produced enough trash to fit in this glass here. And she, you know, when you hear that, your normal impression of a person is that they're a hippie that smells bad and lives in the forest and hugs trees and like, you know, doesn't, and has given, has made all these sacrifices and like doesn't have anything modern. But she lives in a really nice place in the middle of Williamsburg. She's a normal, like, 
um, New York dwelling young professional. She goes to work every day like all of us. But she just basically reverted back to a few things. Like she doesn't use anything that she's going to throw away that she can't recycle or compost. And the when you see the amount of effort that it takes to have that much impact, the effort is minuscule. Uh, so we want to do what we want to do is actually show, and what we do is we follow her, we shadow her, we interview her, and we showcase her uh, to show what she does to say like you can do this too. It's actually this easy. But wait, maybe you feel like you can't do it. Here's a plan to get you on track to doing this. Or you could just do, just do 90 percent. Here's your impact at 90. Just do 50. Here's 50. Just do, or you can do 10. Here's 10 percent. You know, here's your impact at 1 percent. Even if it's 10 percent. So let's say you produce 40 mason jars because she puts things in a mason jar in four years. I produce 40 mason jars in, in a day, probably, mm -hmm. trash, yeah. if I look at like how much you know, I consume as one individual. So the documentary is really about making these very, very easy to understand valid comparisons to empower people to, feel, to realize that they can make a, a huge amount of change. Now you say, how does this relate to the social issues? Well, we vote not just by going to a ballot and casting a vote for a president or a mayor, we vote by what we buy. If companies can't sell shit that they make, they're not gonna make it anymore. So if we choose to purchase things that keep people at the heart of their mission, that have a humane process in the production of those goods and how they're handled, how they're distributed and how they're disposed of, then that's what will become economically viable in the system that we live in. And that's what will speak to the market. So. You know, you may say, well, I can't buy these things because they're expensive. I can't buy these things because only rich people can afford these. Most of the time, that's not true. And we're showcasing that in the individuals that we, that we, show, that we show in our documentary. Most of the times, A, that's not true, just out, out front. But B, it's also about your choices. You can have three throwaway shirts from H&M, or you can have one nice shirt that's going to last you for longer. You know, it's like, where are your values? Do you need 30 pairs of shirts, or do you need seven pairs of shirts? You know, so that's yeah. Yeah. wow. This is yeah. just like super interesting, like you know, the way yeah. it's, it's, to me it sounds like mm. an inspirational moment. Mm. This is this is what these people are doing. Mm. Find your own way. So it's not like it doesn't sound like yeah. it's pretty <clears throat> Not at all. We don't. There's too much. There's already enough of like this is bad. This is bad. Look at this. This is bad. Humans are shit. We're shit. You know. And then and then what? You know. Then what? It's yeah. like. That's that's almost every documentary right now. It gets you riled up and brings you to this new peak of what you feel is emotional awareness and you want to do something and then it just drops you off flat. It's use this light bulb or write to your Congress or here's some positive things that the government is doing. But in reality, like all any kind of bureaucratic system will move too slow. You know, we put all of this weight on the UN, we put all of this weight on governments, on world leaders to be our saviors, you know, like they're gonna solve all the world's problems. In a bureaucratic system, they're not gonna move fast enough. They're not gonna move fast enough at the speed that nature moves. We, this, this awareness, this movement, this kind of culture shift needs to happen from the ground up and it needs to happen with people having a value change and a value shift. Everything that we have right now is pumped at us like, buy this, get this, you need this. You're not sexy enough, your breasts aren't big enough, you're not rich enough, you don't have enough things, you're not successful enough. It's constantly like just being thrown at our face. And it doesn't matter if you don't have television, it's gonna be thrown at you on Facebook. It doesn't matter if you don't have a smartphone and don't use Facebook, you walk outside, it's thrown at you on billboards and advertising. It's become such a norm to consume and to not think about the consumption and what happens to it because we're so busy we're driving to work we're taking care of our kids we're walking the dog we have all of these things that are on our plate that we feel like we can't handle everything so the idea is that the only way that we can change this mindset is to have a culture shift and a mindset shift that values human and sentient life and happiness higher than it does profit and that's possible. We believe it's possible, which is why we're making this film. Um, but it's a matter of how you motivate and incentivize people. And right now, everything is about blame and about these are the facts, look how horrible it is. Yeah, yeah. People aren't going to respond to that. People need to be forgiven and then they need to realize and they need to be shown that you've got all these other amazing things that you can do. There's actually this whole other world waiting and it's wonderful, you know, so. Yeah, it's cool, mm -hmm. like, um, <laughs>
when you think about the trajectory mm. where mm. we are right now, mm. if you're trying to, like, I mean, of course, you can, you can also argue that, you know, events taking place on yeah. a global scale are just like random things. Mm. But, I mean, when you look at the global narrative now, mm. how, we, how we shifted from, like, when you know, this mass production started, mm. and then people started having, like, this crazy hopes in mm. the future. And, and somehow we turned into like this, and now we are fearing the worst. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it, it's, it's really like interesting times we're living right now. Yeah, there's um. There's a huge difference in expectation between people now and people before, like the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. You know, everything for us is instant. You know, we're like, we're on our phones, and if something doesn't download immediately, we're like getting fidgety and like, oh, fuck this phone, I hate this phone, this stupid. You know, it's, 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 you know, like, that reminds me actually, I was listening to a comedian, I think it was Louis C.K., and he was talking about this very same thing. You know, we become so accustomed to feeling so self-entitled, like everything revolves around us. And he's like, you know, it's going to fucking space. Can you just give it a minute? The message is going to space and coming down. Can you wait like five seconds? And it's really true. Like we, our expectations are so extreme for things that we don't understand, you know? And we, you always, you know, oh, this phone sucks, iPhone suck. And you know, it's like, no, the phone doesn't suck. Your life around the phone sucks. Like your perception sucks. And that's the state we're living in. Um, and you know, but that really like feeds into the bigger problems we have that go back to what Sentient Collective is about. Like, I think we will get to the point where we have to realize, you know, we can't have these things instantly anymore. We can't have everything instantly. We are going to have to wait a little bit for this, just a little bit. You know, we are going to have to have just a little bit less of this. And it's not because there are too many people on the planet. It's not because there aren't enough resources. It's because we are not managing the resources that are available to us on the planet properly, especially in accordance to the amount of people that we have. You know, most of the world is covered in water, you know, and then the habitable for humans world, a lot of it is it's really densely packed into cities. You know, there's a lot of open space. You know, the idea that there's not enough space for everyone is a myth. There is. The idea that there's not enough food for everyone is a myth. But we're going to have to realize that we cannot continue to grow at the rate that we're growing at economically, and we cannot have the things that we've grown to expect as like standard, which are really luxuries. And understanding that and being okay with that, you know, that's that shift that has to happen. Yeah. I'm not saying like we're gonna have rations and we can only have one child and we're gonna revert to some like nightmare, uh, stereotypical like red, red midnight version of communism. No, it's just like, you know, I don't need to have 18 alcoholic drinks when I go out with my friends. I don't need to have 40 different pairs of clothes. I don't need to have the latest this or that all the yeah. time. Yeah. And, but that's how yeah. it's so like, yeah. like either you have like this, yeah. like it's so silly what it is, but companies talk about like, um, sustainable yeah. like, That's by default, like, you know, like this is by default, it's like, like a zero is like a point. Yeah. If someone goes, like, if someone else wins. Everyone loses in the yeah. end. Yeah. Everyone's gonna lose yeah. with this game. Yeah. And then, yeah. like, mm. it's so weird how this, um, like, the alternative for this. Mm basically seems to be like what you just described. Yeah. Then we start questioning how many kids we have. Yeah. It's not that like kind of black and white. Well, that's the alternative that's sold to us because that's the alternative that's easiest to get people to reject it. Um, now, I'm, you know, people say, oh, corporations are in charge of corporations, there's a conspiracy, and they're, you know, that's majority probably bullshit you know but companies are smart companies the point of a company and the point of a corporation is to ensure that it's profitable and to ensure that it remains profitable that is the only thing that that entity is concerned with so just like anything that is a living thing you know humans are living beings but we're also living beings composed of billions and billions of other microorganisms, trillions of cells. We're actually a living community. We don't realize this, you know. Like in my eye, there are more living species than there are, you know, on the planet. There's 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 so many it's the same thing in a corporation. It's a collective of different living organisms, which are human beings that act, you know, simultaneously to make this flow. So this living organism known as a corporation has to ensure that it stays alive. That's the nature of everything on the planet. And if that means that it has to crush everything else in order to ensure that it keeps getting profit, that's what it's going to do. Um, 
And let's backtrack because I kind of, what was your original statement? I was going in a direction with this, but I think that's not the direction that no, I wanted. I, I like this direction. It's um, something that's going to relate that to. What was I saying before? Sorry. It's been a long day. Um, but what was the original thing you asked? Because then that'll remind me what I started talking about. Oh no, oh no. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we talked about corporations. Um, oh yeah, so companies and profit, sustainable profit. When we say going backwards. Yeah. yeah. If, if we don't have kind of sustainable profit, if, mm. like if the economy doesn't grow like it's like certain mm. percentage per year, then we are gonna go like back into the dark age. Like All right, so there's that myth, and so everything that's pitched to us is pitched to us, you know, in like it's very subtle. If you watch movies, which are the biggest form of propaganda we have, you know, in our in our modern culture, they shape movies shape the way you think or you think you're supposed to think you know they shape it through when you watch a film if you watch the same film without music you'll feel totally different because the music you've been conditioned to all right this is how i'm being cued to emotionally feel in this moment and that combined with the image fully informs my emotions and now i'm having this emotional reaction yeah you can do the same thing when you play strategically products into a film so product placement's been going on forever you see people in rap videos and films you know the can of pepsi is placed specifically so the camera can see it their watch is displayed in a way when they put their hand here that you can see it all of these subliminal messages are pushed to us on purpose but even further than that there are specific characters that are portrayed there's always the person who thinks that there's a governmental conspiracy is always someone who's like insane they're always some quack you know the person who thinks that extraterrestrial life exists outside in the universe is some crazy person who does drugs you know they always are presenting people as these extremes because that's how you get conditioned to believing this is how the world is so and when I say they, I'm not talking about them, some conspiracy, conspiracy Illuminati in the sky. I'm talking about corporations, companies, people with invested interests in keeping their institution alive that have direct, uh, direct interest in these movies because they fund them. You know, or they have their products placed in them. Yeah. This is, it's all a strategical move. Um, and so when you grow up and your only version that you know of someone who only produces four mason jars of trash in four years is what I explained earlier. Someone who smells bad, doesn't shave their armpits, and lives, you know, in the forest hugging trees, then that's what you're gonna associate as that's the only alternative. You know, you're not gonna make the connection between oh yeah, I can actually living in a mo living in Tokyo, like having a, a modern nine to five job, you know, I can still go out with my friends, enjoy all the comforts of life and not produce any trash. You don't you don't you don't have any there's no context for you to even imagine that kind of association existing between those two things. You know, so the propaganda has to be reversed, uh, for one, but also like people need to have the change in which they understand that these connection, that these associations can exist, that these two things can be connected. Um, yeah. But it's like this, in order for like this, I think people don't realize how much stuff, how much energy, how much effort and money it takes for this whole thing that we're experiencing now to survive, to keep going, like to keep maintaining this completely unsustainable profit-based, just consumption-based model. It takes so much effort. And the proof of that is, let's say tomorrow, right? Every single woman on the planet, when they woke up, they realized they were happy with their body. You know how many companies will go out of business overnight? Just that one, just if, if, if just every woman on the planet was like, shit, I, I, I'm, I'm fine, I love myself, I'm happy like this. There would be total like economic failure because everything that we have right now is based on making you feel inadequate in yeah. some way, right? So there's a tremendous amount of energy that's put into that. And the companies, the people, the individuals, the whatever entity you want to say it is, that's putting that much effort into keeping things the same way, that's a big force that you have to fight. You know, they're not gonna turn around because what they're doing is working and say, you know what, nah, we're just gonna let our business go. You know, we're just gonna we're just gonna let it go, or we're not gonna sell this anymore. They have to be forced, very, 
brutally and almost like economically violently so forced to change and the only way to do that is a grassroots revolution starting with people where people literally realize I don't really need anything I'm really happy I'm happy with the things that are actually intangible that and the things that are tangible too you know that bring me like completely unquantifiable joy you know this food that I'm eating that brings me sustenance I'm happy with that you know I can see my family every day in the morning I'm happy with that you know I don't need constantly for things to change all the time you know yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that was really long. Uh,